good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this year's ITFA, and welcome to this year's industry session co-productions and film financing in the US and the EU. Uh, my name is Laurin ten Houten. I'm the industry relations and talks manager. And uh, today's uh, session is hosted by Day and DPA. And um, yeah, for this I would like to introduce Bridget O'Shea of the day. Good morning and thank you for pronouncing my name so beautifully after I did post on Facebook complaining that the only place in Europe that pronounces it correctly is the very small nation of Ireland. So thank you so much also to, also a shout out to my Irish colleagues, I have been adopted. Um, but uh, thank you so much to IDFA for having us. So just to stand maybe, if you can see me here in the lights, my name is Bridget O'Shea and I'm one of the co-directors and co-founders of the Documentary Association of Europe. We are a new association that is open for all professionals across the non-fiction storytelling fields from independent producers and editors and sound designers all the way to institutions like IDFA, one of also our first members. Um, we founded in February of 2020, but we've already grown to more than 450 people. We will have a more general information session on um, what we do and who we are on Tuesday at 12 here in De Bracha Grand, so thank you very much for that. Um, and basically we do three things, which is um, creating a community of like-minded professionals who are looking for collaboration partners and who uh, need to work outside of their national context. The second thing is that we're um, curating and collating resources and um, other kinds of tools that we need inside of the industry, which is something that this session is going to address today. And then thirdly, we're an advocacy and lobbying group trying to fight for the best conditions for documentary filmmaking um, and financing and distribution across the continent of Europe. Uh, interestingly enough, we don't care where you come from or where you live. We are open to members from across the world. Uh, but if you think that you need to shape and be involved in the European industry, then we'd love to welcome you as members. This group, and thanks also to the DPA, one of our partners, is a, this session today is a group or a joint venture between our two associations and also a sneak peek into a working group that is happening at the moment between the continent of Europe and the continent of North America, which is looking to better define guidelines for good co-productions and good collaboration between the two continents when we don't share treaties. And so with that very long-winded introduction, I would love to give the word over to Tracy Holder from the DPA to also introduce the DPA and what you do and who you are. So thank you, Lorene. Thanks, Bridget. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tracy Holder. I'm thrilled to be here. I see old friends and hopefully new ones in the audience. Um, as Bridget said, um, I'm, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from North America, from New York, a separate country from the USA. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, and um, the Documentary Producers Alliance uh, is a relatively new organization as well. And actually, my colleague uh, Ina Fickman, who has a film premiering here at IDFA, will tell you a little bit more. And then we'll turn it over to our illustrious moderator, uh, Darren uh, Wolford, uh, a UK based producer. So I'll be um, quite brief. Uh, the DPA, which is the Documentary Producers Alliance, um, we have about 300 members worldwide, primarily in North America and primarily in the United States. And the group was founded in 2016 with the view of representing documentary producers in the conversation about you know, what is our role and how do we make our community of producers more sustainable and equitable. And that's really the focus of the DPA. I sit on what's called the interim board because we were going to be electing a new board in the new year. And we've been very active for the last four years. We've established two very important guidelines. One are the crediting guidelines and the other are the waterfall guidelines. And I know, I'm a Canadian and I know that in Canada and in Europe, there's no, there isn't as much of a tendency to have equity in your projects. But of course, in the United States, it is, you know, Many, many documentaries have private financing. So, you know, how, how do you recoup? And also always representing the voice and the rights of the producers. And um, I think what's interesting about the work of the DPA 
and 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 your work as well is that I what I feel as a Canadian is I fall sort of in the middle. We're looking for business models and ways of collaboration that encompass all these various financing and creative endeavors. So I, this is a really exciting moment for, for both of our associations to be able to do a deep dive into how can we make this work worldwide. I've done a lot of treaty co-productions, but in the last few years I've been doing non-treaty, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, productions, but co-productions in the sense that there's been true collaboration between all of the partners. So on, on that note, I'd like to say that you know the DPA is open to documentary producers worldwide, and we'd love it if you joined us because we feel that creating a sustainable industry is really key, not just for ourselves as producers and entrepreneurs, but also for all of the creative people that we work with. Can I Thank just you. add one more thing? Uh, just very quickly, um, well said, Ida. And um, we are—we have an international uh, subcommittee. There are many different committees within the Documentary Producers Alliance. And Christian Pop, one of our, my panelists to the left, uh, and I are on that international committee. And we are currently working on a toolkit, which will help explain sort of the logistics of co-productions, both from a North American perspective and from a. Uh, a European or non-American perspective. Um, and it's not yet done, it's in the works, but it's something that we're hoping will be a useful uh, resource for everyone to help sort of pull back the curtain and demystify the process, whether you're on this side of the Atlantic or on our side of the Atlantic. And part of the panel today is talking about some of the mechanics that will be in that toolkit, which will be a bit more robust than what we have time to cover today. Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll just briefly explain what the two sessions are about. So the first hour will focus on sources of documentary funding in North America and how those compare to funding models in Europe. We'll also be discussing how those models can complement each other and other territories. And then in the second hour, we'll devote to some specific case studies of co-productions and how the funding landscape is changing. And I have a little bit that I wrote in bold because it's important for me to remember to say this. So, it's important to stress that this isn't just about co-productions with and about people in North America and Europe. It's a discussion about the world of co-productions from different perspectives and how best to make the most of those opportunities to partner up from any country and from any background. Uh, and uh, we'll have some concrete uh, uh, slides about how you can get that funding, particularly in North America, uh, later on. Uh, and we've got a lot to pack in, but we will absolutely try and make some time for questions at the end of each session. Uh, and so before we start, I should just introduce our panel. And so uh, for, to my left is Tracy. So do you want to say a few words about yourself? And then we'll go around the room. Sure. Um, again, I'm Tracy Holder. Um, I work both in the industry, but I'm also a filmmaker. Um, I spent a, nearly a decade as a consultant to Women Make Movies, the world's largest uh, distributor of films by and about women. But while I was there, I worked with filmmakers in all stages of production. And for reasons I can't fully explain, I've had a lot of success raising grant money for my films. And I've sort of become the grant whisperer, helping uh, explain to, uh, to filmmakers, both in the US but also abroad, how to, our process of accessing funding, primarily uh, grant funding from the US. There are a lot of American funders who are interested in non-American films, but the system is so different outside of the US that a lot of non-American filmmakers don't understand how they can have access to our funds. And so I do a lot of workshops explaining that. So that's me. Thank you. Chia? Hi, uh, good morning. This is Jia Zhao, and I'm a Chinese-Dutch producer based in Amsterdam. Uh, I think maybe partly due to my Asian cultural background, I tend to have a bit of a non-European taste when it comes to uh, film production. That also means that I will have to go a long way to get things somehow financed. So, well, there are several examples at this ITFA that uh, well, one of them will go in premiere tonight. It's actually like really a patchy work to, to get this fan. It's called a Marvel Travelogue. A lot of co-productions over there. So, yeah, if you have a chance, uh, you can go to have a look. It's like uh, from the east and west, everything together to get this done. Yeah. What's the name of your film that's premiering today? Oh, uh, Marvel Travelogue. 
Yeah, but there are several others like uh, Zhao Liang's uh, I'm so sorry. It's also an example that you really kind of have to, you know, do co-production to make this happen. Yeah, so that's Thank it. Thank you. Ina? I'm Ina Fitchman, and I'm a producer based in Montreal. Um, I'm Canadian, although I do spend a lot of time in the United States. And I've been producing creative documentaries for more than 25 years, and it's my passion. And it's also something that I've realized it's important for the sustainability of my company and for myself personally to figure out ways of producing and co-producing that make sense in the current environment. And I think there are a lot of opportunities. I've raised money. I've done many treaty co-productions because Canada is really well known from that, co-produced considerably with, with France, with Israel, with Germany. Um, but I've also done many projects in the United States, and I'm at a point now where I'm realizing that it's really important to bring these systems together. It could be very exciting, and not just to bring them together on a financial level, but also on a creative level. And that's what drives me, is creative, working with wonderful directors and writers and teams around the world. So I've been very privileged, and I hope to be able to continue to do that. I'm very excited for this conversation. Christian? Hi everybody, good morning. Uh, so I'm Christian Pop. I'm a French producer with a German passport, born in Romania. Um, <laughs> so nobody's perfect. Um, so my company is called Yuzu Productions. Um, it's a pretty young company, only 10 years, almost 10 years. Um, previously I was also a producer for other companies hired in Germany and in France. Um, and before that I uh, used to work as a commissioning editor uh, for Arte. Um, so we work a lot internationally. We do a lot of European co-productions. Um, we have worked several times with, with America, but um, in a way I wouldn't even call that a co-production, what we did. So maybe we can come to that a bit later, um, how difficult it was and where the difficulties were. were uh, a lot actually in in a mutual understanding to find a com or the, the, the failure in a way to find a common language on, on several topics. So, and this is why I'm so interested as well to be in this working group and, and create this, uh, this tool kit actually for better collaborations uh, between the two territories. Thank you. Um, so obviously we're talking about co-production, the ways in which we can all work together, but there are some distinct uh, differences. And I know you mentioned that you know, private equity is a particular uh, characteristic of working in North America. Can you and Tracy just tell us a little bit more about, about how that works for people that may not know? Well, as I, as I said before, you know, as a Canadian producer, we're not used to that model. <laughs> but I think more and more, for example, Hot Docs has a a fund called Hot Dogs Partners, which is almost like impact partners in the United States, where a group of investors who, are, who love and are interested in, in documentary film have come together to look at projects that they could potentially invest in. So yes, it's you know, subject driven, but it's also the idea of recouping your investment as well. So it's very new to Canada, but I actually think that that's you know, the model of the future. I mean, like in Europe, in Canada, we have public funding for documentary. In the United States, that's not the case at all. So, or, or not really, you know, like you don't... Like, teeny. Teeny, right? So many of our co-productions are based on broadcasters, I'm talking about documentary, and funding from the government and tax credits and maybe a few private funds, but not necessarily equity funds. So, you know, we, we can take a deeper dive into it later, but the North American model, especially the American model, which Tracy can talk about, is based on that private funding model and finding these investors to contribute or to invest in your project. Yeah, I mean, it's a really shifting landscape. Um, and in the past, I'd say decade, all of a sudden a bunch you know, we'll call it equity, wealthy people uh, have uh, documentaries become sexy. And uh, I th my theory is also after uh, Al Gore did Inconvenient Truth, that you had a bunch of, you know, the environmental movement was trying to shift the conversation around climate change and nothing they were doing was really moving the conversation forward. And Gore does this film, and all of a sudden, for a brief moment in the United States, people believed that climate change was real. 
And I think as a result of that, a lot of wealthy activists realize the power of documentary to put a human face on a lot of wonkish abstract issues and help galvanize public sentiment around issues. And as a result, a lot of private money came into documentary, which in theory is very good. Um, but on the other hand, what has also happened is that now you have a lot of wealthy investors. They literally are, it's like a commodity. And, um, and they are either driven by having some social purpose or wanting to make impact or wanting to stand on the stage and get an Academy Award. Or they, but they, what they all have in common, as Ina said, is that they really want these to be profitable and market driven. You said that they, uh, they've entered into the documentary world. But but where are they? Like are they like are they at Idfa? Like do you how do you bump into Sundance. how do you bump into yeah. a really nice wealthy, wealthy person? Yeah. Yeah. Well you have to sleep around effectively. <laughs> that would be one one strategy, one I've not yet it's, it's accomplished. Quite a tip. Quite a tip. Uh, but but there are organizations like Impact Partners mm. was the first in the space. And it's a bunch of wealthy people and uh, they do, they have somebody, the executive director does financial analysis, is always surveying the landscape, trying to see what is being produced, and then looks, does a business plan, and if they think it is a viable film that has commercial potential, they then will reach out to the filmmaker, or the filmmaker can go to places like IDFA, get on the radar screen, there are, there's the forum um, at, at Hot Docs, there's, um, Indie Film Week, Gotham runs in New York, there are Sundance, Catalyst, there are lots of places where you can get on the radar screen of the industry. Um, and then if, you, if they vet you and you meet with them and you are willing to take equity, and not all of us are totally on board with that, then you do a dog and pony show for the, for the board of the organization. And with Impact Partners, it's each investor can decide how much of their investment they would want to put into your production. What the downs, so there are- And when you say investor and yes. an amount, what kind of amount are you talking about? Yeah, I want to, I want to address that because I think that's what, you know, you know, getting back to the DPA is that, you know, as I said before, many, most of our members are American and have been dealing with two issues. One is crediting. So many of these investors, you know, you go to Sundance and you look at the list of, you know, they have something that they publish every year where anyone who's had a film in Sundance and has one that year, they list all the films they've had in the festival. And then you see the executive producers and you go, oh my God, X person has had 20 films in the festival. And you go, wow, that's crazy. And then you realize that they've actually put $10,000 into every film. Right. <laughs> You know, because as soon as someone hears that you've gotten into Sundance, they want to jump on board. So one of the things the DPA has been dealing with is in our crediting guidelines saying, whoa, you know, producers are producers, meaning we're the ones from beginning to end who are shepherding, taking the risk, working with the creatives to make the film the best it can be. And we don't want investors to come in and take a credit which is really not appropriate to the work they put in the film. So in the United States this has been a big issue and this is why some producers have been reluctant to go into this is because they're like wow like someone's going to put twenty thousand dollars in my film and take a producer credit? I don't think so. So on the one hand you have that part of the work that the DPA has been doing and then the other part which you know again in Canada and Europe we're not quite used to is this notion of the waterfall which is really how does an investor recoup his or her money and these are really important tools that if you go on the DPA website, you can read because it will help you understand how a private investor, because, you know, it's not free money. You know, unlike grants, it's not free money. And, and, and people do expect to recoup because Impact Partners, Hot Dogs Partners, Chicago Media Group, they all, people, individuals involved, are hoping to not just get their money back, they're not hoping to get rich, but they're hoping to take that money and put it into other films. So many impact partners and hot dogs partners, you know, yes, they might put some money in their own pockets, but ultimately they want this money to go back into the system. Sorry to be so long-winded. But, you know, in the waterfall guidelines, you'll see, again, how do we protect ourselves as filmmakers and producers so that we are not working for free either. 
So, you know, you don't want to get into a relationship where the invest you haven't gotten paid and your investor is recouping. So take a look at that, because these are complex relationships if you've never done it before. Okay. Just maybe one note about the waterfall, even the term. I mean, I heard it for the first time like four years ago, and uh, I imagined a waterfall. <laughs> uh, so because I, 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 I wasn't uh, aware of this. Um, so basically, this is the question, who is paid first and who is paid second, you know, from the revenues? And it's, it's indeed, we are not used to that in Europe. But nevertheless, there is a waterfall also uh, with some funders. Uh, public funders, where you it's it's not a grant, but it's an um, advance, you know, on recipes, they say, avant sur recette in France. So, or authors, they are in the waterfall as well with a percentage of revenue. So, and uh, um, a big one of the big questions is also how to match the two waterfalls of private equity, of private investors who want to be first, um, and uh, other public or private um, uh, funds in, uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. I uh, just want to clarify one thing before we move on just to, uh, about equity. So it is still a very small percentage in the United States. It's gaining popularity. It's becoming big. But I think DPA determined it's like less than 20% of our members who have dealt with equity. So on the, on the negative side is that these are investors. They're looking for market-driven films generally. And they want, it's at roughly 15% above their investment, but they get paid back before anybody on the film team does. And that has been the part that I have found problematic. On the other hand, they have relationships that most of us don't have. And they can open doors and they can get distribution deals that you know, certainly the likes of me can't get. But if they put money in, they then have to approve any distribution deals. I'm no longer free to just distribute the film as I see fit. So there are positives and negatives, um, but it, and it's a shifting landscape, and it's just becoming a bigger and bigger part of the puzzle. Right. Okay. Um, so let's move back to Europe uh, and look at another difference. Uh, let's talk about regional funds. Christian, do you want to just... Kick, kick that conversation off. Look, I'm from the UK, so we don't have that much equi you know, private equity access. We certainly don't have anything like sort of a regional funding model. So for people that may not be aware of how that works, how, does, how is that quite distinctive to this part of the world? Um, well, what you mean by regional funds is more actually the national mm. uh, funding. Well, well funding I, I guess it's a bit of both, isn't it? Inside each nation yeah. or most of them, so you have also regional <laughs> funds. Um, so, but maybe one step before that, so I would say that the European co-production or production model is, um, is more public than private. So there is no private equity or very little is coming in now. Um, so, and is, it, these are subsidies basically that we get. So either it's of course licenses from, from broadcasters, uh, and if not, they are public subsidies coming through uh, film institutions, established film institutions, and they work necessarily on the national level or uh, regionally, you know, uh, to sustain and to promote and to strengthen their local industry, their national industry. So uh, they are very competitive, obviously. Some grants are automatic, like in France, you have an automatic TV fund some conditions, but most of them are selective. So you submit your project and then you, you get or not uh, a grant from, from your national film fund, or if you're in a particular region who supports cinema or supports documentaries, who supports TV as well, um, then you can get also a, a regional grant. Mm -hmm. And and Gia, for you, what parts of the, the European pie is it easiest for you to secure co-production finance? Uh, well, I think it's a little bit similar. The Netherlands, of course, is a smaller country, uh, but it does have a very established system in terms of a public funding. So it's a bit similar, but it's also different. In, we do need to show this waterfall, uh, for instance, uh, before you get any fund, uh, because they, I think yeah, this could be interesting if you are going to co-produce with a US partner, because our film fund will look at that before they grant that funding. And uh, typically, I think for a do documentary film, uh, they do expect you to go beyond the border. So they won't finance you fully, 
I think maximum, if it is a majority production, that differs also from minority production. So the majority would cover up to 75. Uh, if it is, uh, that's the max. Yeah, so the rest is up to you where to find, to, to close a gap, also to stimulate the, clo you know, cross a border kind of collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Now, earlier, uh, Christian, you were mentioning about the waterfall, and you mentioned like the author might get some, the producer might get some, et cetera, et cetera. Now, those are already, again, from a UK perspective, those aren't roles that necessarily exist in the UK. Uh, so for people that may not be aware, like the, the actual like, an anatomy of the like, European co-pro model, like from beginning <laughs> to end, how does it work from the moment someone might have an idea to that moment where it's screening at a festival and it's, it's screening on TV and people are hopefully making some money from it as well. Of a co-production or of a documentary, let's say, but production? From a, from a co-production. Co okay. No, actually, okay. not from a... How many minutes? <laughs> 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 um, no, but I mean, uh, I realize myself indeed in, in mm. our discussions with our friends from DPA that, that the, the American model is so different. Um, but usually, and it might seem obvious for, for the Europeans here, so um, you have an author or director who has an idea, who has a beginning of a project, who has something in mind, a story that she or he wants to tell, and um, uh, then approaches a producer. You know, so um, there are very, very few documentaries that are made in Europe without a producer. Uh, they are. I mean, sometimes, of course, the, the director is also the producer, but uh, you need a legal entity, actually, even to start getting money. So there are some exceptions, so there are grants, development grants for, uh, for authors uh, directly, but most of the money, actually, that you can get, also, obviously, a deal with a broadcaster, um, they have been, they are handled by a producer. But to go back to the beginning, so... Um, um, so a director starts a conversation with a producer. Sometimes it's the opposite. So a producer has an idea and approaches a director and they discuss and they develop something together. Usually there is no money involved at this point or very little. It depends on what the situation is and what the relationship is. Um, but the producer, they don't have that much money up front. So everyone takes it risk to, to discuss this. You know. so, but at the moment when uh, um, both feel safe with the project, with the story, with how well it's developed. Um, usually what we do, and it's not the same in, uh, in our company, it's not the same everywhere in France, it's not the same everywhere in Europe, is that we sign an option agreement, which is uh, the first legal step in a way, so that me as a producer, I have to write to, uh, to go shop, actually, to go pitch this project to, uh, to broadcasters, to funders, etc. Uh, most of the funds they require, uh, to have already a signed option agreement. So basically the right to represent the project. Um, so, uh, and then we, we start financing, developing through grants, um, sometimes through TV channels who are paying first a development grant because they don't want to invest uh, instantly in, in production, uh, minimize the risk, um, go to pitchings like ITFA and, and elsewhere, uh, present the projects there. Um, funding the, the films and then um, finding co-producers internationally depending on the film so uh, uh, I'm talking about co-production I always start by saying don't co-produce unless you really need it you know so uh, um, and why is that? <laughs> no but I mean <laughs> because this forces you actually to, to define what the needs are you know and the needs they are obviously financing but they, they, it's much more than that you know, it's the creative collaborations you, you were talking about, it's the, the mutual inspiration. In COVID times, for me, it was very important to co-produce because it helped um, to do remote production. You know, you optimize things. A co-production is always a bit more expensive because they are two producers, they have to, to make a living, they, 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 are they are travel costs, the communication costs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but, um, so what is the need? And is actually what we get out of a co-production more than what, what we would sustain and what we could, could manage when we are alone. So therefore, don't co-produce unless you need it. You know? <laughs> so, um, okay, so going back to this kind of narrative, <laughs> so, uh, um, so you, you find your co-producers, you, you, you finance <coughs> the film again, uh, bless you, um, usually through, uh, through public funds, in your own territory and public funds uh, in other territories, um, and uh, and then through 
TV co-production or pre-sales. So meaning that you try this principle of territory, ter territoriality, which it has ruled our industry for years and years and now is challenged by the streamers. Uh, it's still in place that I pitched this project to a French broadcaster and then to a Dutch broadcaster and then to a Canadian broadcaster, etc., etc., And I, they secure the territories and give me money for this license. Um, and this is the, my production budget. And at some point, of course, we have already a budget and a financing plan in place. We say, okay, we have enough money to make the film. It's, it never happened to me that it was 100%. So that we said, okay, we are fully funded, now let's start. You know, But we start when we, uh, we feel safe enough um, that we can deliver the film because especially when you when you you sell a license when you co-produce with the broadcaster you guarantee that you will deliver the film and if you're not able to do so you cannot you cannot start filming you cannot uh, launch the production and finally uh, all this obviously is very collaborative and a long process and at the end the, the films they are then watched by the broadcasters green lighted by the broadcasters ultimately um, uh, shown uh, with the festival uh, run before in, in most cases and that's it. I don't know if I answered your question because it's... Uh, you answered that question and a couple of others, so yeah, it was very, <laughs> it was very useful. Thank you very much. Sorry, that's me. It's me. Um, and so, I guess in, in, in comparison, Trace, because when we were having a discussion beforehand, it was clear that it was, it was a very different experience for, for you and other people in North America in terms of yeah. trying to get co-productions off the ground and trying to get things into production. Right. There are, there are two things in Christian's model that are the same. One is that um, when you start, there's no money to pay anybody, and uh, that you're never 100% financed no matter what. Those are the two. That's where it, it uh, begins and ends in similarity. So in our case, and obviously each project is different, there are different variables, but generally, it, Either a, a director has an idea, or like Christian said, a producer has an idea and they reach out to a director. But then it really is on that team or that individual. Like I, against all better judgment, have just started my own new film. And um, I, I'm doing everything. I'm my producer and I'm the messenger, I'm the director. You know, there's nothing that I don't do. But in order to, for the film to be viable in the world and to secure funding, the things that I need to do, either if I had a producer who was willing to, who believed in the project and was willing to donate their time as I'm donating my time, we would uh, write a proposal, a lot of time spent on that. We would create a really compelling pitch deck or lookbook, and we would have to create a very strong sample reel. So that's, that's a significant investment of time and money. Um, there is one funder out there uh, who has realized that, you know, it sort of limits who can participate if the barrier to entry is a strong financial one. You know, not everybody is in a position to be able to make that financial sacrifice. And so in the second half, we will talk about specific funders um, and including this one, which is called Catapult, but most of the time you really are having to front that money and really so much of the pre-production part falls to the team. Once you have those elements in place, then you can start going out to pitching forums, you can apply to grants, you're then out in the world. Um, I generally like to start with grants, and I think most people start with grants because those are non-recoupable funds, right? A grant is made by a so, foundation. So, so free money? It is free money. Nice. Nothing is free in this world, as I've come to learn. <laughs> um, but it is free in the sense that it is made by generally a foundation or a charitable organization, and they are giving you that as a donation as opposed to an investment. They are not expecting any financial return on that. They believe in the project and they want to see it out in the world. You have certain benchmarks and deliverables you have to meet because they want you to finish the film and to get it out in the world, but that is it. And the reason that I focus on grants is that I keep all the rights. 
right? So unlike Christian, who is going to all this constellation of broadcasters and giving away more and more rights, when I'm done with my film, if I can fund it fully with grants, and so far, this film that I've just started, I've raised close to $600,000 in grants, and that I haven't given away a single right. Um, so then I can sell it in the open market. So what most of us do is we go as far as we can with grants, and then we take equity if we can't completely fund the budget with, uh, with, with grant money. Um, and there are other sources. You could go to a broadcaster, you could do a pre-sale, uh, you can go to streamers, you can go to studios. There are other options, but my particular model is, is grant-focused. I'd be curious, I know you, I have, think, have a very different... Uh... Yeah, I mean, and also my, most of my colleagues in the States have moved away from the grant model simply because it's tremendously competitive. I mean, it is. Tracy is a genius when it comes to this. <laughs> no, you are, but most people are not. And most people, like, the amount of work you have to put in to actually get a grant in the U.S. is... is it, didn't you say it's easier to get into Harvard than it is to get... Yes, yeah, so, so when, I, <laughs> when I do my workshops, I use a... I reference uh, a headline from the New York mm. Times, which was about how much more difficult it's gotten in recent years to get into the top Ivy League schools. And they profile three. I think it's Harvard, Stanford, and Princeton, where the average acceptance rate is between 5 and 6%. But to get a grant from the Sundance Documentary Fund or Chicken and Egg, a fund for women filmmakers, it's between 2 and 4%. So it's easier to get into Harvard, as you pointed out, Darren. Um, that said, the other advantage of grants, and this is something that I really practice and believe, is that it really is part of my artistic practice. It's really where I work out my ideas for the film and that I use it. Like, I front load my film in pre-production. I am really clear when I go into production what my film is about, and I use the grant writing process to work out structure and a lot of things, knowing with documentary it's not scripted, things will change. Um, so obviously the hope is that the grant will lead to funding, but even if it doesn't, it has moved me forward creatively. Um, but it is no, and, 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 and I'm not, it is I'm not anti grant. Don't no, don't get me I, wrong. I, I hear it's, you. It's, it's, it's and and where I agree with you in the sense, and, and in Canada, and I'll talk a bit about Canada now. You know, we do have development funds, and and as a producer, I, I don't think I've made a, fu a film in the last at least ten years where I haven't had some level of development because, you know, unlike the United States, which always shocked me, a lot of my colleagues in the states go out and shoot their films. And right. they just start, and they hope to God that they'll sell them at some point or get into Sundance. It feels or, like quite a risky strategy. It, but, but people, <laughs> but you know, you, would you agree? Like the independent 100%. filmmaker, it, 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 like in Canada, we're so used to government and funding that we're a lot more risk averse. Like we're used to getting either regional, like you know, provincial funding or national funding to at least develop or do a sizzle and then pitch to a broadcaster. And we do have, as you were saying before, like, I mean, we do have private funds that recoup and our regional funds actually do want to recoup their money as well. So I it's not all free money. Um, but we do have more of a tradition of development and not taking the risk of going out and shooting your film. And I think a lot of Americans <laughs> do go out and shoot their films and it's always, like, to me it's been like, Wow, like that is really risky. Yeah, what we do and, is and insane. There's just no <laughs> way around it. It is Well that's it. So like yeah. like I think like in Europe as well, a lot of my European colleagues, you know, don't go out and shoot half a film before they get any money, right? Well I think in Asia they also go just to shoot that film. <laughs> oh interesting. Um, and and Gia, from your perspective, what is what is the route to market for, for how you're you're co producing? How similar is it to the things that we've heard so far? Uh, I think Christian is more uh, deeply rooted uh, into, of course, this European landscape, which is very much public broadcaster driven. And maybe streamer is coming in, but not yet uh, that much present. 
Uh, as an Asian producer, I think I do see the upcoming of the streamers from Asia. Uh, not only Netflix and all that, but they are also regional, uh, like Tencent and all that. They do fund projects as well. And so you sell the right, but uh, that's also becoming part of my financial model, I would say. So it's indeed, I hope, of course, Sundance, but that's indeed very competitive. And I also use European fund, uh, when, but I don't use that much of pre-sale if it's not needed. As said earlier, I don't want it to split them already before it's get made. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess it's also will influence the making process of the film because you will have to kind of satisfy all kind of needs when it comes to the editorial input. I, I guess the edit yeah, the, in the editing process, you will have a lot of opinions if you have too many people on board for that matter. So I kind of try, my model would be like European, but in combination with um, Asian fund. And in terms of the starting point, how much uh, time and money would you be putting in yourself before you were receiving money to either develop anything or produce anything? I think it would be a little bit equivalent to what you call development funding. Mm -hmm. I think in Europe it's about uh, 25K to mm -hmm. 30K euro. Great, okay. Um, I am conscious of time, um, and we have a talkative panel, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which means that you have an opportunity to ask lots and lots of questions. I hope you get some great information. Ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. Um, wow. So uh, I'll, I will hand it over to the audience for questions. There's a hand up there. Good morning. A uh, question is to Tracy. You, you spoke about uh, a sample reel so that the funders or the powers that be right. get a sense of your directorial approach. Um, is that an alternative to having a short documentary, so a short version of the documentary conceptually, put that out to the world, get it run in festivals, you have a name, it's your business card, and then that's a proof of success, then you develop or go further into the feature long documentary which one which side do you side with so most since i focus on grants grants require that you have a previously completed work as well as some proof of concept of the new work so that can either be a trailer the one i'm seeing is increasingly funders want to see more sample scenes I think they want to see, is this a character I'd want to spend time with? Is there an emotional arc to the film? Um, so I encourage people, and in my own work, am really focusing more on, um, on having something that sort of brings them into the film. A lot of people make short docs and then they want to make them into features. And one of the big questions that comes up on panels is, that short film was fantastic, what more do I need? And I think people have to be very careful about that because that's generally like, this was great, and do I need more? So I hope that answers. I mean, I'm a big believer in whatever you want to call it, a sizzle reel, a demo, a proof of concept, because any buyer or most buyers today want to see that. And if you, you know, whether you're pitching at a, at ITFA or Hot Docs, you have to do that work or, or, or anywhere else. And I think it's really an important process for a creative team to go through to help understand what your film is and the storytelling, the characters. And even if it costs you $10,000 or, you know, 10,000 euros, I think it's money well spent, um, you know, in, you know, I, I think there's more of a tradition, or there has been in Europe and to a certain extent in Canada, to write very detailed treatments. But now I think a deck, which is a combination of a visual presentation with some words on paper that actually explain your project, and a sizzle. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's not just pictures, <laughs> right. in other words, which, which is nice. But, you know, something that people can scroll through it and you know, whether you use Adobe or another one of these programs so that you can just, it, it, it actually is a very immersive, it can be a very immersive piece. And, and a sizzle reel or a demo mm -hmm. is what most, most buyers are expecting today. And they, it, 
you can have made 10 feature docs, but you come on this new project, or five, maybe not 10, but let's say you've directed three or four feature documentaries or even a short film, nobody will say, hey, that's enough. They want to understand what that film yeah, is. Completely. So I, for me, I'm a, a passionate believer in spending the time, a small amount of money, it's really worth it. And Gia and Christian, are you finding the same in terms of needing to have some video yeah, material just to tendency. get people on board? Yeah, I think the same. I always encourage the author to make it, if it is not that much yet, just find the most related one to show so that people could feel you, I think, then you are talking. Yeah. Well, More than in words. France, writing is still extremely important, writing long proposals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah. maybe it's a literary tradition, I don't know. Um, I, I love literature, so in that sense, I, I, I encourage that too. But uh, indeed, having a trailer, a teaser, visual material about the project, about your characters, um, it becomes almost compulsory. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Uh, hello. Um, my question is, in, in the proposal, um, it's, it's not a specific question, but an, an, an inquiry in an area, uh, the director's statement. Um, what do you, ex like, as producers, as broadcasters, what do you expect in, to be written there? What are the things that, oh, when you read it, oh, this is, this is good, this is appealing? Um, because I see that in a lot of grants. Especially now, why are you the one who should be making this film? And I think that, you know, maybe two, three years ago it wasn't as important, but absolutely right now, you know, you know given the, the climate and the fact that we want to respect the provenance of stories, um, why are you the one who should be telling this story? I think is really, at least from a directorial absolutely. point of view, is well, essential. Uh, actually, in, in France, we separate it between author's note uh, or not of intention, mm -hmm and a director's note. So it's the why, you, and why this film now, and how. You know, the director's note, I mean, in our definition is more kind of how you will make the film. What are the means that you will use? Will you use music? How you will use music, etc. You know, so it, it's a mixture of both. But the, the why is more important because you have a, a visual material to show already. So I... Do you? Your, your intention, your, why, it's a creative your, motivation, approach. your motivation. And also your creative approach, right? Like how you're going to tell the story. I think some of the fund, um, also including the Dutch fund, will require you to know what you, how you artistically would like to approach this. So this is next to this motivation. You know, you, no motivation, I think the director's notes, you need to know what you want it to do how you want to do, but also why it's you indeed that's going to do this. So it's like personal plus professional, I would call it. For Sundance, I think you need to write this topic summary. Yes, um, well, which is about relevance, right? Why do we need this mm -hmm. film now? Um, but one of the things I'd encourage everyone, whatever you're writing, is, you know, we are all in the fishbowl of what our needs are. We, you know, we need to pay our rent or we have a, a subject who's elderly and we need to get to it now or something's timely. And funders are outside the fishbowl looking in. And so the important thing is to step outside and to know what their needs are and what your proposal is or anything that you're writing is making the case as to why your project aligns with their mission, how you're serving their needs, not how they're serving your needs. And in terms of the director's statement or why you, you know, at this moment of racial reckoning in particular, and certainly in the United States, this is front and center, people want to know if you are covering another community, why do you feel that it is appropriate for you as a, somebody outside of a community to go inside? Now it's a moment where there's authenticity is really important and access is important. And so addressing those questions is really key. Um, and one thing I encourage people to do is to try to like write a review, to pretend it's the great moment your film is done and it's the day after, right? Your film has just premiered at IDFA and now you're reading The Hollywood Reporter, a review of your film. What would you want someone to say about your film you know, a, a review just gets to the essence of the film. It's, it can't be very detailed. And that's a good way to jumpstart writing about your project, like to start thinking about what do you want the audience to be left with? What was the feel of the film, the main characters, main plot points? 
Thank you. Any more questions? So we understood that the, the models between uh, European and, and American way to produce is all different. Uh, the question is how we can take the best of the two models and how do they combine or what are the obstacles for this combination? Well, we're trying to do it in Canada because, you know, I mean, we're a country that has actually nurtured many documentary filmmakers and companies and it's become a little bit unsustainable because it's very competitive. So h how do you combine both models? I mean, I still, you know, and I'll talk about it later, I still really love to do treaty co-productions with Europe because, you know, our systems allow, you know, our, you know, are really similar. So we have a combination of public-private funding, you know, in documentary, even if you're doing a feature doc for cinemas, chances are you're financing it through television in some way, shape, or form. But the other aspect that has really become interesting for us is equity. And, and as I said before, Hot Docs, you know, the, the documentary festival, you know, they have an equity fund now. They've been nurturing a group of investors who very much along the same model of impact partners. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, the, and there's nothing that precludes you, like I just did a film that you know, precludes you from you know, getting a grant in the United States. I mean, I'm doing a film now that has Catapult. It's a Canada-German co-production, but we did get development money from Catapult, which is a great thing because they're an amazing group of... of, of, of visionary women who, you know, really understand the need for, you know, provocative creative documentaries. Um, similarly, another project that I, that I did that's a Canada-France co-production, we have equity from someone in the States. Someone actually I met at Hot Docs three years earlier who tracked the project and then toward the end of the project came out with, you know, $50,000, you know, equity investment. Um, and looked at my waterfall to make sure that they fit and that it would work for them. So I think it is possible, you know, at least in that context, to combine systems. I mean, where it becomes tricky is in the key creatives. So, like, I can't have an American, if I do a co-production with France, I can't have an American director. However, I can also decide, you know what, I'm not going to do a treaty co-production, but Arte is going to, through Christian, give me money for the film. He'll take a fee and a credit, and and we can do we can work with this American director. So it, it can't be an official treaty co-production, but it can be. And Julie Goldman, who many of you know, does that often in her films. That she, you know, does work with Europe um, with American directors, uh, but you know they're not co-productions per se, like in the legal sense of the word. And I think all of us who've been working in co-production, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being a little long-winded, for a long time are actually saying this system has to change and has to be more fluid and open to all of us collaborating. In other words, it's going to crash. We've maybe got a chance for one more question and a very quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Alina. I'm a Romanian producer, and I'm just involved now in a film that has a Canadian co-producer as well as Germany. And I was, I'm very curious to know, in a, uh, from your perspective, how would, how would you act as a Canadian co-producer from the moment you receive a proposal which you really like and you start getting involved? I will be short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I'm a very practical person. I'm driven by creative. I fall in love with directors all the time. But if I read a project and I say, you know what, I just can't finance this, I won't get involved. Me too. You know, so I have to feel, and I'm sure you're like that, I'm sure you're all like that. You have to feel that, you know, for many years I'd go to ITFA or Sunnyside and I'd come across amazing projects and then I'd go back to Canada and I'd be like banging my head against a brick wall. And, you know, because nobody wanted the project. So I do a, a very basic analysis of can I, at the very least, fund it in, in Canada, and if not in Canada, in North America, because I've gotten involved in projects where I haven't gotten Canadian money or I've gotten just tax credits, and I've, you know, I have a lot of international relationships, so I've sold the project. So for me, just to be short and sweet, it's about looking at it and being very honest and realistic about what my possibilities are. Okay, so we're at the end of part one. <laughs>
Yeah. I'm sorry. If you would like to join the association, I have discount codes to 10, for 10 percent <laughs> off your first year fees. So I have the Commercial code with me. You can just come and get them. Exactly. How embarrassing! How embarrassing! But if you would like a 10 percent discount, I can give it to you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, so yes. This is part one. Part two, we'll do, do a deeper dive into some case studies. I'd also say, let's keep it fluid. If there are some questions that you didn't get to ask in this session, then we can always start or in the next session and, and, and roll in some of those questions too. So we'll be back here in about half an hour. Thank you, everyone.